Good afternoon, everyone from Singapore. My name is Clemens Che, and I'm a research fellow at the National University of Singapore's Middle East Institute. Today, we are having the 12th installment of our Bridging the Gulf Public Education series, and this is the best way to run off this year of, of webinars associated with the Gulf on heritage and modern, modernity. And we are having a comprehensive panel set up today. Uh, five of my colleagues will be discussing this theme. And they are Sultan Sud al Qasmi, Roberto Fabri, Lina Ahmed, Marco Sosa, and Suha Hassan. So they are also equally contributors, two of, which, two of whom are also co editors of the recently released book volume, Urban Modernity in the Contemporary Gulf. So, of course, this comes in with a lot of developments in the region on uh, culture, arts, for example, uh, the Dubai Culture and Arts Authority recently in September launched a culture and heritage project on Google Arts and Culture. This also comes in tandem with the ongoing Katara 11th traditional Dao festival in Qatar. All these have to do with heritage, but today we are tackling questions on the urban landscape. And then of course, to say a few words about, about this is also on that whole debate between memory versus history and memory of course embedded in the inhabitants embedded in living societies as the french historian pierre nora uh, mentioned that history on the other hand is the reconstruction of what has happened so today we want to discuss such uh, questions and also answer, try to answer and tackle these thought-provoking uh, themes and also answer the question of cultural legacies national identity and, and asking questions to our speakers of the interactions between the built environment and its inhabitants. So a few words, a bit more on Gulf cities that most of them still possess the port functions that symbolize their multiple links in the world. And the origins of most Gulf cities allows us to situate them in today's context as, as port cities became industrial and financial nodes, service centers, uh, political capitals because of their water connections and the urban concentration so but what really you know is 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 about their development from the coastal areas inwards uh, becoming more and more urbanized and subjected to rapid developments according to master plans and, and what is the gulf modernist oil city today in this curious blend of remnants of the past so the fact that cities themselves really possess multiple natures. This sets the stage nicely for our discussion and presentations today, uh, because in the Gulf context, no city, whether then or now, can be simply a port, but must be involved in a variety of, of activities. And at the same time, how do they preserve cultural legacies? And in most instances, when these initiatives are also state-led, how can also a cultural reuse, uh, a, a term that has been used in our, in the co-editors of the book, uh, Urban Modernity, Roberto Fabri and Sultan, Makassabi, they brought up the whole notion of the culture of reuse. So how can this culture of reuse be instilled in such consumerist societies of today? So with that, this brings us to our first presentation of today. Uh, by Sultan Sul al Qasmi and Roberto Fabri. So what is going to happen, the format of today's webinar is that first presentation, followed by a presentation by Suha Hassan and the third presentation by Lina Ahmed and Marco Sosa. So after these three presentations are done, we'll have the Q&A. And of course, the audience, you are, are free to put in your questions in the Zoom chat box, which I will then, of course, uh, pose to our colleagues and speakers. So a brief word on our first presentation speakers. Sultan Sul al Qasmi is the Kuwait Foundation Visiting Scholar uh, for Fall 2021 at the Harvard Kennedy School. He's also the co-editor alongside Roberto Fabri of the recently released volume, Urban Modernity in the Contemporary Gulf. He's, Sultan is also you know, the co-editor of Building Sharjah, uh, also released recently. And he's the founder of the Barju Art Foundation in Sharjah. He was MIT Media Lab Director's Fellow from 2014 to 2016, a practitioner in residence at the Hagab Kavokian Center at New York University in Spring 2017, and also a Yale Greenberg World Fellow in 2018. So he has been a visiting instructor 
instructor at US universities, including Yale, Georgetown, Boston College, and also taught in France at the American University of Paris and Sciences Po Paris. Roberto Fabri, Dr. Roberto Fabri really is, is an architect, researcher, and associate professor at Zion University in the UAE. His interests focus on narrative spaces such as heritage buildings and museums, preferably on the global south. And he has been an architect consultant with UNDP. He has also participated in the rehabilitation of the Kuwait National Museum and completed the transformation of the American Missionary Hospital of Kuwait into a cultural hub. He has led a number of initiatives on restorations. He was teaching at the University of Bologna in Italy and at the American University in Kuwait, a regular face at international conferences. Dr. Roberto is also published extensively in academic journals associated with architecture. So without further ado, let me hand it over to the speakers of our first presentation, Sultana Kasmi and Roberto Fabri. Over to you guys. Thank you so much, uh, Clemens, uh, for inviting us. Uh, and uh, thanks to the Middle East Institute of uh, the National Un University of Singapore. Uh, I had the pleasure of visiting a number of times. And thanks to those who are attending. I think uh, we'll begin by uh, my colleague, uh, Roberto, sharing uh, his screen. And um, my, our presentation is divided into uh, two parts. So I will try to whiz through uh, my segment. <clears throat> I think I'd like to begin by uh, speaking about the uh, my conclusion uh, my conclusion chapter in uh, in the book where i tell the story of a um, an uh, an uh, aging leader and uh, this uh, leader here in the uh, um, in the gulf let's say uh, had decided to convert his uh, his uh, once uh, palace that was converted into a museum to convert it back into his own residence. So I will just read to you the paragraph from the chapter uh, because I think it's easier than to uh, explain it in detail. So I wrote, when one of the aging rulers ordered his advisor to convert the Emirates National Museum back into its original state as his residence, the advisor met the decision with incredulity, but the task of stripping down the structure back into its original form began. The National Museum signboard was dismantled. The glass vitrines were taken out. New furniture was brought in. The change, however, did not last long as the aging ruler's health continued to deteriorate. He spent the last few years of his life confined to his home and the fort was once again discreetly transformed back into a museum. So the reason I wrote this was these are kind of the stories that you only hear through a sort of oral tradition of the Gulf. That you, these are stories that are not written by scholars. You really need to be speaking to, uh, to family members of these, these rulers or just maybe distant relatives or advisors. And I think what the story illustrates is that this, the idea of modernity and progress really is a fluid structure, of a fluid uh, process or concept. Sometimes it can go forward, but sometimes it can also go back that the idea that you have a, uh, a building that was converted to, to a public institution can once again be converted back into being a, a private uh, um, structure that's only accessible by a few. Um, we'll go to the next slide, please, uh, uh, Roberto. I also like to emphasize, other than the, the, the concept of fluidity, that sometimes neglect is a blessing in the Gulf when it comes to heritage. And sometimes the, uh, you know, the idea of the location being so strategically important, the opposite is true. When the location isn't so strategic, you find many of these structures existing. And this is something you see in places in the Emirates, like in Ras al-Khaimah, Al-Jazeera Al-Hamra, which is a uh, uh, 17th, 16th, 17th century settlement that was inhabited by two or 3,000 people. And the entire population of this uh, island, or it's a sort of a peninsula, were, had uh, left the peninsula and moved to Abu Dhabi in the 1980s, seeking better livelihoods. Now this place, ladies and gentlemen, and the audience, has become the core uh, of the, uh, of the uh, Ras al-Khaimah policy of urban regeneration, opening up to tourism, because this village or this township is almost perfectly preserved. There was no sort of um, uh, capitalist kind of ambition 
to convert it into uh, towers or anything. This was because it wasn't seen as prime location, these buildings were preserved. The same thing can apply also to places, for example, in the Emirates like Hatta, Hatta village today in Dubai is once again at the core of the preservation drive of Dubai. And we saw the rulers of the UAE last week celebrate the 50th anniversary of the UAE in Hatta because it's so well preserved. And the same thing happened, for example, with Muharraq in Bahrain, because it's not in Manama, because it's not in the central, the center of the city, it has a greater chance of surviving. Can we go to the third slide, uh, please, uh, Roberto? Uh, the other thing, the other concept I have is sometimes heritage really is the idea of, uh, 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 it sort of clashes with the idea of layering, that an old building isn't always just an old building. An old building is a product of layers of additions over decades and decades. Uh, this structure, for example, was built in 1932. It was a British commissioned airport built for them. Um, the structure, ladies and gentlemen, includes, uh, you know, um, uh, items or elements such as concrete, aluminium, and glass, in addition to coral, mud brick, and palm tree fronds. So here you, you see a merging of heritage as well as modernity in one structure. And this building survived for decades and is now a museum. So where do you place it? Do you place this as being a heritage structure or being a contemporary building, uh, especially with the additions that you have? Uh, the other thing is, this building is, is fascinating for me because it includes Western sort of trained architects, but also local craftsmen, local uh, workers and builders, men and women who probably constructed this building alongside these Western trained engineers, uh, maybe an architect. Um, and then you see another image of what it looks like today in the fifth slide, just to show you how uh, sort of, again, you see the coral, uh, the, the palm tree fronds, the, the coral, the mud brick, but also the glass, the concrete, and the aluminium in one picture, which I think is a fascinating building uh, for us. And then finally, in, uh, in the next, in the final slide, I would like to share with you um, the idea that in many cases, uh, a heritage can be reconstructed and rebuilt. This is a, uh, a fort that was built originally in the early 19th century in Fujairah. This fort was uh, demolished and then uh, much of it was rebuilt and it became the center of Fujairah's tourism drive, its GDP drive. It, it is now on the posters, it's on logos, it's, you see it in stamps. And so heritage can be seen as a way of rebuilding national identity, of rebuilding a concept uh, that everybody can unify around. It can also, also be seen as a as a tool to legitimize uh, uh, the, the, the ruling families of the UAE and, and, and as an indicator of the longevity of these ruling families. We've been here for hundreds of years. So this is a concept that can be, can be used to uh, uh, sort of uh, legitimize this rule. And finally, it can be seen as a marker of regional interactions, conflicts and alliances, uh, uh, whether this fort was used as a base to, uh, to receive dignitaries or use as a base to, to, uh, to plan uh, defense uh, or even conflict is, uh, is something that can be seen through visits to this museum. So heritage is intertwined or this structure is intertwined with the national history of, uh, of these uh, buildings. And sorry, my last slide, uh, Roberto, was uh, closer to home, Sharjah, where you have what is referred to as the Wall Street of Sharjah, these buildings, that were designed by a, a Spanish architectural firm in the 1970s. And they were built around a uh, 18th century fort. And this is the, uh, the tower, the only tower that survived from this fort. And just like in Fujaira, it was rebuilt almost in its entirety. But I would like to argue using this slide uh, because today we see that uh, the government has decided to demolish some of these buildings and rebuild the heritage of the early 20th century and 19th century. I would like to argue or make a, an argument that when enough time has lapsed, these structures, these modern structures also can be considered heritage. So if you, if you consider one or two or even three generations being born and brought up, this becomes part of not only the urban landscape, but also the urban heritage of these Gulf states. Uh, and this is the argument I would like 
to uh, make before I hand over to Roberto. Thank you. Thank you, Sultan, and thank you, Clemens, for inviting us here, and thank you for to all the audience that is with us today. So, uh, picking up from what Sultan has just so eloquently discussed, I also wanted to reflect on uh, the idea of heritage and modernity and the possible conflictuality between these two terminology, or maybe as, a, as, a, as we see it as part of the same uh, discourse, like two different sides of the same coin. So while I was preparing my presentation, I was going through um, Clement's uh, text uh, uh, or introduction to the panel, and I was like um, stuck by some, some keywords that I was keep repeating um, the, the, the idea of demolition or the bulldozers are here. Um, and this uh, phrase that I'm, I'm quoting here in the slides, so this reference to the Dubai Creek and the demolition of one of the rulers old coral houses. So uh, while I was preparing my, my presentation uh, last week, it was a holiday here in the, in the UAE. And I had the chance to travel to Dubai and for, for the first time in my life, I had the chance to stay longer on the creek to have a room for a couple of days and actually try to sense and feel this contradiction between uh, modernity, contemporaneity and, and traditional uh, dwellings. So I've been going up and down the creek quite a lot uh, with my camera and trying to, to find these places of conflict where you know the modern concrete buildings uh, were like uh, aggressive towards the, the pre-oiled mud houses and to be honest I couldn't find many situations of this kind. I couldn't find uh, pictures, uh, old picture where you know concrete structure where you know eating uh, space on the creek uh, from uh, demolishing coral houses but the, the the current situation it, it's it's different. The current situation is that on the creek you have the left bank that is Pastakia, which is a very well known um, project of rehabilitation or revamping, I would say, of old of an old part of the city, and now is a is a big tourist attraction. And on the right side of the creek, you have this concrete curtain of 1970s buildings, most of them from the late 70s and early 80s. Um, there are, um, some of them are, are still there. You can, those who are familiar with, with Dubai and its architecture could recognize some familiar facade like the, the, the old uh, Emirate National Bank, the Deira Tower, in the center, the, the Carlton Hotel, the, 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 the Sheraton Hotel, um, all these buildings that consolidate or help to consolidate the myth of Dubai as a modern city. So it, before the Burj Khalifa, before the Burj Al Arab, commercial were using this building to, 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 to speak about how our cutting edge architecture was, was in Dubai. Um, so on a side, we have uh, a traditional, I mean, we can discuss a lot if uh, the reconstruction or the, or the work in Bastakia were philological restoration or reconstruction, but the reality is that this part of the town now is not longer in danger of demolition and is well uh, accepted as a tourist attraction that speaks about local, um, uh, local traditional architecture and pre-oil life and the, the proximity between this, the buildings are exact, exactly the same as in the pre-oil life. And on the other side you have the, the modern buildings that are not, uh, there are in danger of demolition for the same reason that Sultan were, was mentioning before. They are mostly built in prime location in, in, in uh, areas where you know the, the, the square meter uh, has a lot of value. They are not normally they are not that tall that they are exploiting enough uh, the, the 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 footprint uh, the plot of the land, 
and most of them are not in, um, in, in very good condition. So zooming out from Dubai and going to the Gulf as a whole, we can see as demolition is a pattern uh, in, in, in many cities, especially in the last 10 to 15 years. Uh, we have seen, since we have started monitoring the, the modern heritage, we've seen a lot uh, disappear. Some of these buildings were made famous for, uh, because, because they've been demolished. They were not famous before being demolished, but then they became some sort of uh, academic uh, fight you know, for, for preservation. Um, and I'm referring to the Suwaber building in Kuwait, for example, but other like Kuwait Airways or, or the Adnok building in Abu Dhabi. Uh, and as, as you can see, I mean, even magazines are, are, are now picking up this, this topic as like, you know, so let's save the, the memories from the 70s. Um, the other chance that these buildings are having lately is museumification and also Sultan discussed this topic and uh, museumification saves the building and actually transform it into a very attractive uh, uh, reinjection of new cultural life in, in the city. But the question is how many cultural center and how many, and how many galleries can we have in the city or can a city afford? No, we have many, the, the building stock is large and how many buildings do we have? So these were mostly the, 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 some of the reflection we had in mind when we, Sultan and I, start building the book um, Urban Modernity in the Contemporary Gulf. So the building wants to read the, the modern, the modern ville, the ville moderne, the, the, the concrete building, the concrete uh, city of the 70s in the contemporary Gulf's life. What are the survivals? What are the, the connection between these buildings? How the new uh, life absorb these uh, sh uh, these shards of a previous vision, and at the same time we wanted to put the um, accent on the on the fact that these buildings are obs obsolescent um, and obsolescent. In in our opinion, is an opportunity to rethink the the life cycle of a building in a different way uh, for the Gulf. So, and here I'm, I'm, I'm trying to conclude um, the building, uh, the book is, um, is uh, made of three parts. The first part is working on, uh, is, is more of a, an historical part, if you want. It goes through um, a series of, of stories behind the, or in the literature about uh, modernity in the Gulf. Uh, the second part, tackle the idea of uh, the relationship between East and West in building uh, cultural and technical exchanges that you know, generated a series of, of, of the, the, the built environment of the, um, the late 20th century. And the third part is the modern in relation to heritage, which is the core of our discussion today. So um, for this, we have invited um, two, actually three contributors from part three, which are Suha Hassan, who, um, is, uh, who wrote a, a, a chapter uh, focusing on Bahrain and a specific building on Bahrain, and Marco Sosa and Lina Ahmed that are uh, instead working on uh, the uh, Emirates, the United Arab Emirates. So that marks the end of the second presentation. We'll move on to the third presentation uh, by Lina Ahmed and uh, Marco Sosa. So a bit on their profiles, uh, Ms. Lina Ahmed holds a master's from the Architectural Association School of L Architecture in London and has more than 10 years of and has more than, sorry, and has more than 10 years of professional experience working across different sectors and project stages in the UAE. Her design work ranges from proposing alternate schemes to detailing and executing architectural packages. Currently, Ms. Ahmed works at Zayed University in Abu Dhabi as an associate professor and is also the chair of design. Her work that has been published and presented at conferences worldwide, as well as awarded and exhibited 
includes contributions towards the UAE's National Pavilion at the 14th Venice Architecture Biennale. So she's also an advocate of digital fabrication technology and its impact on regional higher education. The other speaker, Mr. Marco Sosa, is an, also an architect and associate professor of interior design and the assistant dean of research at Zaid University in Abu Dhabi. He holds a postgraduate diploma and master's in architecture, a BA ONS as well, and has over 10 years of experience in the industry. In 2012, he published a book, Al Badia Mosque, a visual essay about the oldest functional mosque in the UAE. In 2014, he was appointed as the head of design in the curatorial team for the UAE's first national pavilion at the Venice Binali, which also charted the impact of modernist architecture in the Emirates. So today their presentation will be centered uh, around the UAE. And without further ado, please let me hand it over to both of them. Hello. Hello everyone. I'm just working this out. Hold on one second. Okay, can everyone see the screen? Okay, great. Just gonna close this up. Okay. Um, hi everyone. Thank you very much for um, joining us uh, this in this conversation. And also would like to thank the um, uh, Middle East Center, the National University of Singapore for allowing Lena and myself to be here. Um, good morning and good afternoon. Well, Marcus Sosa and Lena Ahmed we're both associate, as you say, professors of Said University. And, and today we're gonna to be sharing with you an ongoing journey that we have, uh, where we would like to share it with you as actually academic researchers and faculties at Zayed University. And our ongoing, which is ongoing forever and ever, <laughs> of a grassroots approach, not only documenting, but also spreading the awareness of amongst the new generation of young designers coming through the ranks about the modern, modern heritage in the UAE, because we believe this fulfills a major learning outcome for students on cultural literacy, as these students are part of their, uh, as the students, uh, these buildings are actually part of their built environment. Oops, sorry, it's not going forward. Oh yeah, okay. UAE is part of the Gulf Peninsula, neighboring Oman and Saudi Arabia. Abu Dhabi, which is the capital, is where we work and live. Um, Abu Dhabi Emirate, just to give you a quick rundown of how, how quickly the pace of modernization has gone through upon oil discovery. Um, and this would just give you a, a small glimpse of how much it has changed. This is actually an image of the ruler's uh, palace or what's normally known as Qas al Hassan. And this picture was taken in 1965, and you can see it's actually surrounded by um, ephemeral structures. There's some coral housing, but it's, most of it is Arish uh, Panthorn uh, dwellings. In the late 1970s, following the unification of the modern Emirates, you can see the aerial view where streets started to form, surrounding Castle Hosson and where concrete buildings began to rise. In the following image, you can see taken in 2013, is now very much evident, the impact of multi-story high-rise buildings upon Qas al Hosn, which is now completely surrounded. The fast-paced development resulted in many of the buildings remaining as doc undocumented. When demolished, they disappear, thus erasing a part of the nation's architectural history. Their recollections remained only in their inhabitants' memories. To give you a sense of how rapid is the change, here is a diagram of our Qasr Hosn urban surrounding areas uh, six years apart. The buildings marked as red on the diagram on the right are now demolished. And these are a few images of, of taken very recently of driving through the streets of Abu Dhabi and noticing how more buildings from the 1980s and 90s are continuing to be demolished. Now, we are not advocating, and it's something that I think um, Roberto also touched upon, about saving every single building. We understand that some of these, uh, the reasoning for demolishing, uh, these buildings and they usually are waste the preservation of the buildings and we're calling for the need to have a building some of these buildings properly documented and recorded as part of the city's architectural evolution. In 2014 the first UAE National Architecture Binali highlighted the in-between architecture and called for the start of a comprehensive archive. 
Well, a few, bu few buildings like uh, the famous Sheikh Rashid Tower, otherwise known as the World Trade Center in Dubai, are well documented. The future is more or less certain. Others not so well-known buildings remain in the background of development, but at the foreground of our city's inhabitants' memories. So we developed three approaches, um, which we've been following up from, from when we started working together and working with our students. One of them, uh, the first one is, is, and we'll be showing them today in our, in our um, presentation, one of them is the series of case studies in which we, we take adaptive reuse as a proposal for a lot of these buildings in Abu Dhabi to give them a new lease of life. Uh, the second one is uh, describing a series of, of, uh, of, uh, of methodologies that we adopted for recording a lot of these buildings, uh, modern heritage. And the last and, and, and the most recent one is uh, a case of alternative documentation, documentation methodology in which we're using digital technology and producing point cloud models and using this uh, digital design proposals and and somehow and uh, integrating them within the point plan model, so the students can actually envisage their uh, their their creations or their designs within those spaces. For the first methodology, we selected to show you three examples, and you can see the locations of these sites on in in the context of Abu Dhabi city. The first one is the um, uh, one that actually was presented again by Roberto, I think, uh, which is the Adnok residence, uh, Residences, which was built by Constantine uh, Cups and Bellies Associates in 1977. Um, and this is a historical image <coughs> taken in during his heyday, if you could call it. And then a more recent image while the new headquarters for the Adnok was being built uh, with Etihad Towers to the left. So you can see the different scale uh, that now that's that's more recent to Abu Dhabi, and uh, and the building is very peculiar because of its shape. Uh, it has these semicircles and and joining circles as it as it as it, uh, as it and and it's kind of extruded uh, to forming this um, flat uh, for residences. Basically, uh, unfortunately, all the residences have been now demolished. The, the yeah. Yeah, the sorry. students worked on the buildings just before its demolition when only one part was demolished and they looked at the circular plan with all its difficulties and complexities. Uh, so they took the spaces and distributed them horizontally, vertically, but also laterally. Uh, two case studies here as, as an example responded to present social needs within the local communities in Abu Dhabi. The gallery for the blind, where the students placed emphasis on the interiority of the space through sensory mapping and explored various conditions where these different materialities come together and interact with the indoor and outdoor uh, spaces. And uh, the second one is the Emirati dwelling, where the students tackles the complexity of the modern Emirati household and how it can be applied in an apartment. The second site is in the Abu Dhabi bus station. As, as opposed to the Adno building, which is demolished, the central bus station is still operational and safe for the moment. Uh, this is in current state. It was built in 1986 <coughs> by a Bulgarian uh, architectural uh, company. And in its original state, it was actually painted white. Uh, this is before now the land beyond that you see at the at, um, on the on the um, on the north of this image is actually the where the new Alwada Mall has been constructed, which uh, I say new, but it's probably about ten years old now. But it has given it a new lease of life because it becomes a conduit between between the um, the the transportation system and this um, this new shopping mall. Um, okay, so the first two ex two examples are of, of um, adaptive reuse of the actual interior of the spaces themselves, especially the spaces that are, are currently under use. The student, one of the first students, Nora Lamar, Almena, she uh, proposed um, an urban art gallery uh, acting as a conduit between culture and, and between transportation and consumerism. 
And the other student, which is the other example, wanted to explore the integration of a public library in the station and the, how can the act of reading and pausing be as an opposition to the act of traveling and moving and transitioning. The third topology is something that it's it's we, we started developing uh, for the past five years and we started noticing and also through what the students themselves are exploring and it's the concept of Abu Dhabi ruins. Now the concept of ruins has different connotations depending on, on what part of the world you are but here um, we we adapted it to use it for for um, for buildings that have been basically um, they were built around the 19th, late 70s to the early 90s have been left abandoned due to the fact that they're no more financially liable and they've been or deemed unfashionable, old, and they've been left to decay and remain in a derelict state. So the third side is located between the bridges. It's an old wedding hall that is still in the memories of our students, parents, and grandparents. The students' vision was to give the existing a dignity it deserves by not demolishing, but creating a symbiotic relationship between the existing untouched conditions and the new additions. Interestingly, the site was actually demolished before the student completed her proposal. The second methodology is photographing the building facades. It's actually um, and expressing them as flat elevation of photos. The method follows a low-tech approach of several taken photographs stitched into a long, flat elevational photograph. And some of the photos, some of the buildings that we captured um, are obviously the Cultural Foundation built 1977 by, by the Architectural Collaborative, the House of Shay Mohammed built in 1958 in the and um, and the Sheikh Zayed uh, City Stadium by Henry Colbrook in 1979, and the Blue Souk by Michael Lyle Associates in 1978 in charge. The third methodology touches on the notion of making, and this is through prototyping of building facades. So following the, uh, the previous methodology, we also developed a way of, of photographing uh, facades using um, allowing um, to, to change the distortion of the perspective um, in a post-production, digital post-production of the photograph, in which the photos into the, and the photos were actually made as flat as possible to create an ele elevational image of the building themselves. And then the pattern of the building was is defined and studied. In this example, uh, the Obaid building in Abu Dhabi. It is important to note that this is not a tracing exercise, but rather an analytical study of the spatial and geometrical relation that forms the pattern itself. So from the pattern, the pattern was then extracted and drawn. Uh, and from that, an elevational drawing was generated to a building where a documentation did not exist before. And from there, a model of the geometry that forms the building was generated using laser cutter technology. We worked with our students on several buildings. Uh, Sheikh, Sheikh, uh, Sheikh, Sheikh bin Rashid Tower, also known as WTC uh, in Dubai, the Ibrahimi building on Electra Street in Abu Dhabi, uh, and Alain Supermarket building on Al Stiqlal Street, also in Abu Dhabi, and Al Taiba building on Electra Street. This also led for us uh, to implement a similar approach in a completely different, by the way, the class before was, was actually CAD. And that's from there, we developed a meaningful project and a brief so the students not, not only uh, fulfill the learning outcomes, but they also learn about the environment, the built environment. So the second approach is that to use, um, which we adopted for, for a class called Material and Culture in the UAE, in which the students responded to these buildings by the by producing um, jewelry uh, the sign and actually not just coming up with a sign, but actually making it themselves. And so the scale of the building actually became the scale of the human body. Since we, since we, it's not saying that it's a result, but uh, there has been, since I would say maybe 2014, there has been a great interest on this kind of um, preservation and, and articulation and sort of highlighting this kind of buildings and this kind of, has been a lot of artists and designers. Um, the UAE has been fortunate to see some amazing talent grow and 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 develop their own ways of actually um, 
photographing and capturing the these buildings um, and and it, it, and it, of course it varies from not just uh, digital artists but also from traditional artists as well and this brings um, us to the last section <laughs> sorry Lee. And from there, we moved into dealing with actual buildings. Up until then, we were dealing, yes, we we're dealing with actual buildings, but we were working off photographs and off, uh, and off images. So we we're photographing and generating the material from that. Whereas here, we actually took the students to the building site and the students interacted with the building, with the site itself, surveying it. And as opposed to uh, working with low technology. Now we brought the technology in and we started working with 3D scanning. And the case study, the building that you see here is what was called al Qubaisi House. It's one of the few surviving examples uh, from the late 1960s uh, where, they, where they, uh, the modern material started being brought to the country. Yeah, sorry, Lina, it was the late 1950s. Late 1950s. 50s, sorry. <laughs> sorry, 50s. And it was thanks to, um, to uh, this, uh, DCT, which is Abu Dhabi Department of Tourism and Culture, they allowed us to, um, they, they were very helpful in allowing a whole group of 25 uh, Emirati students, female students coming in and actually spending a couple of days in the, in the site recording and analyzing and, and immersing themselves in not just about the physicality of the site itself, but also the, um, the trying to sort of tap into the memories through their own uh, memories within their own families and their past. So that was for us, uh, it was an interesting site, which, uh, interesting exercise, which goes back to what Sultan was talking about, the idea of stories and how the stories somehow, they play an important role within, uh, it's not, we're not just talking about physical building, bricks, bricks and mortar or coral, but we're talking also about other stuff, which is much more ephemeral. This, this um, developed into the, the, start, the students' own vision of how the spaces were used according to discussions with their own students, uh, sorry, their own families, and, and in which they develop uh, traditional uh, drawings, okay? Uh, traditional drawings, sections, elevations, um, hold on. Oops, sorry. Nope, I lost it again. Sorry, guys. Something happened. And then, and then, yeah. Sorry, Lena. Yep. And from there, they started generating future narratives of how could this space be inhabited by uh, alternative programs and alternative modes of inhabitation. Uh, And the students themselves, they started to, uh, um, or normally what we do in, 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 as those of you who are um, architects and architectural practitioners and students, and, and um, we, we draw our proposal with the existing here, we were trying, we, we brought in, we're doing exactly the same thing, but we're doing it three dimensionally because we are, um, we are forming a, a digital model in point cloud of the existing, and then the students are, are making the three-dimensional the digital designs proposed, and we are incorporating it. So we're somehow integrating it within. So the students themselves immerse themselves into their actual site and the, into the world of the site, and they, they can actually see the, the signs. So for most of these, even though you're cinema static, they are they are developed from also from from animations. Okay, and thank you very much for your, sorry, we had to write, there were so many images that we didn't know if we had enough time, <laughs> but thank you very thank much you. for your time. <laughs> thank you very thank much, you. Marco and, and Lina. I think it's uh, really fascinating that you took us through that digital methodology and also what better way to, to understand, you know, the past, you know, by surveying these uh, houses and also built environment up close and personal and then reimagining reimagining the narratives that, that were of the past. So thank you for that. So now we've uh, come to the Q&A segment. We've done our three presentations by our five esteemed speakers. I'd just like to uh, put out a note to our audience that their book, all of them are contributors to the, to the volume Urban Modernity in the Contemporary Gulf. So that book can be found on the Routledge website as a hard copy or as an open access PDF, if you so wish. So now we've moved on to um, the Q&A segment and we've got a number of questions coming in, but let me 
uh, exercise the the privilege as moderator to to ask my first question because you know we've been through this theme of heritage and modernity back and forth, and you know there are some writers, for example, in, in one of uh, of the books by uh, Yasser Yasser Elchesh Tawi, he said that the Gulf cities are unburdened by history, and of course you know there's so much scholarly debate on this. There's also uh, writings on this. So what about, what are the speaker's thoughts on this, you know, especially on recreating that communal life of the past? And, and you know, we, we talk a, a lot about demolition and, 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 and the built landscape, but really, you know, heritage is also about a way of life that was between then and now. So what has changed, what hasn't, what remained, you know, I would like to hear some of the thoughts from our speakers. Perhaps we should start from, the first two speakers, maybe Sultan, you like to, 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 to start with, start answering. Thank you. Thank you, Clemens. Uh, I must say that even though I'm familiar with Marco, Lina's, and Soha's uh, work, I really enjoyed their presentations and the lovely images that uh, Soha showed of uh, the beautiful custom house and, uh, and Marco and Lina's images, especially the ones where the students are entering and exiting the, this, uh, this old 1950s uh, house. Uh, seeing this, these two generations sort of coming uh, uh, together. Uh, so with regards to uh, what's been happening in the Gulf, in fact, uh, Clemens, I feel a bit more encouraged than I was a few years ago. Uh, but by 2007, 8, 9, I was alarmed by the pace of the, the destruction. But I feel like over the past three, four years, especially, there has been a realization across the Gulf and the Arabian Peninsula, even of the importance of uh, preserving many of these buildings. Dubai coming in with its own laws. Uh, we see preservation uh, in Saudi Arabia. Uh, unfortunately, as Roberto said, so many of them have been turned into art galleries. Uh, so we must think of more creative uses uh, of these buildings because not everything will be an art gallery, but art galleries are a, a, a great example of what's been happening recently. But I wonder if we can think about converting them into libraries, uh, public spaces, places that are not only accessible to people interested in one facet of society. So, uh, so community spaces, of course, is another thing. Uh, so I feel more encouraged, but I allow someone else maybe to chime in. Thank you, Sultan. Roberto? Um, thank you, Clemens. Well, of course, I align with uh, with Sultan uh, positive thinking on, on, on this topic. The situation is better than before, or at least there's more attention. Um, demolition or reconstruction or rehabilitation of adaptive reuse, it's, it's, it's not only an architect speculation or not even a scholar speculation. It's, uh, it has to be discussed uh with with all the people that have interest into that and like all the operation related to preservation it has to be there has to be uh, uh like some some sort of benefit for the owners to keep the structure up if we don't find this way to give uh, a return something in return to the owner I mean, this is the, 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 the battle is lost from the beginning. And um, I mean, in other places or in other situations and for uh, the traditional old architecture for what it means, uh, there's always a way <clears throat> because there's, if you restore an old building in, in, in my place, for example, you got a cut from the tax. From, from the taxes. So that will encourage you to keep you know, up with your, your old, house even if it's not ancient because that will be beneficial to your your your, your wallet in the long run um, that is difficult to imagine for um, for modern building but there must be a way in which is convenient is economically convenient to keep the building up um, f regarding the, the the question uh, I mean, these buildings need a lot of work to be readapted to contemporaneity, but I'm sure it can be done. I mean, it depends from case to case. It can be done, but of course, the 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 the, the, the energy we save in the moment we 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 save one of these buildings is is way more than the energy we waste when we demolish one of these buildings. The, the, the ecological footprint of a, of a demolition of something like the 
the Adnok resident building. It's it's huge. I mean, what, what do you do with that pile of rubbles? I mean, it's not that it could be grounded into you know gravels or or, or the entire building. So um, that's why I was thinking. I was saying in my presentation, we have to rethink the life cycle of a building. It's an opportunity. I mean, instead of you know following some greenwash theory that everything should be green and everything should be sustainable. I mean, most of the sustainability of an operation is already there. We have to learn how to, you know, to, to, to transform this building in something that is alive, is not a museum, is not mummified, is not frozen into the past, is not a museum of itself, of the building itself, but it contributes to the, uh, to the regular life. I'm thinking about a building I never, spoke much about which is the um which is an office building in, in in kuwait city that was actually retransformed into an office building it was an office building before now it's an office building i think Gulfnet is in there which is our internet provider while before it was it was i think it was a bank um and that's as simple as that it's not a revolution it's just you know some 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 slight touch to keep the building in this place with his own, you know, features, and and just give back to his own nature from 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 the beginning. Thanks, Roberto. Uh, I think he, Roberto answered one of the questions that came in on on the to do with ecological and, and global temperatures. But but let me bring it back to the communal living and and re reinventing that whole communal living, uh, you know, in, in urban space and urban landscape. So, uh, and Lina and Marco, do you have anything to add? I mean, you guys went through the whole digital technology of, of how the students, you know, generated the narratives in the past. So, you know, what, 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 what did they find, you know, in, in terms of this communal I, living? I think, I think for us was really, it, this common question came, came through, um, you know, especially when, especially a, um, following what Roberto he, when he raised it on his on his presentation as well, this, um, that that the the DCT themselves they when we met them for the first time and we went through the whole uh, this house itself which was falling apart originally and then they rescued the they cleaned there and then they prepared and then they say to us look the common problem that we have is that we do this with these properties and then but they, we keep them because they have a historical value but we can't, we just don't know what to do with it. And there's so many coffees and, and as you say, galleries, but also or, or, um, boutique hotels that we can, we can make. Um, so we need new, new strategies. And that's, that was, that's what prompted us to actually say, okay, this is what we're going to do. We're going to take this and we're going to do all this recording. And again, fulfilling learning outcomes, by the way, just normal learning outcomes, but we try to bring in cultural literacy into the, um, into the, into, into the studio. So that, so the students themselves, they begin to sort of question themselves because they, originally they come in, they're all interior designers, by the way, they're no architects. And they all come in thinking with a kind of interior decorator mode, thinking, okay, well, why are we not sort of looking at the Burj Khalifa, maybe take one of the floors in the in Etihad Towers and actually redesign it into a, into, a, into a wedding shop or something like that. And then saying, well, yes, we could do that. But then this, is, this will be much more interesting. And suddenly they find themselves having conversations with their grandmothers with the grandfathers, with the great aunties and great uncles, and then trying to discuss and trying to, in a way, become archaeologists as well, not just um, anthropologists as well, in a way, uh, and, and try to understand how the spaces were used and how they can be used now. Um, and, and because they are from this time, you know, maybe their families are from that time or from, from the, some of the, my great grandfathers as well. But now they are from this time, so they understand the power of, of social media, they understand of, uh, you know, that some of them were born in the beginning of the century, so they don't know anything different. So how can they actually apply their needs as 21st century Emiratis into, the, into, the, in, into these kind of buildings and at the same time keep the, some sort of integrity, cultural integrity that these buildings have rather than just completely get rid of them. Of course, this is a, 19, a lovely 1950s, kind of late 50s building, but the same applies to what Roberto was saying, especially all this chat that we had at COP26 about, about, um, about the environment. Now, this is, this is a, a serious problem that the building industry has in itself about building new, new and where we have some 
some very interesting samples of, uh, of these typologies all around the, our cities. And it's not just a UAE problem, by the way, or Middle East problem. It, it's, it's happening all over the London has its issues, trust me. There's plenty of beautiful, brutalist buildings that, that I'm sure Singapore as well, they might have, um, that have come down and, and they could potentially be saved and turned into something else. Sorry, Lena, sorry. Yes, Lena. Um, I just want to add to that. What's really interesting is that usually when we start interacting with the students and bringing them into this initiative, there's a resistance from the students, like Marco said. But through the immersion and through them spending time with these buildings, that resistance develops into almost affection and almost care. And, uh, and they start seeing slow, very, very slowly, they start seeing these buildings and these structures almost through different eyes or, or glasses. And from our perspective as educators, I think the vision is that it's a, it's a, it's a bottom-up approach so that when these students graduate, they become the advocate, they become, uh, they, they become the, the ones who speak up and communicate and act, what to save, what to adapt, what to document. Uh, and also, they, over time, they the vision is that they become the conduit where they spread this importance in the society and in, in the, itself. Thank you, Lena. So with the remaining time, we, we do have a number of questions coming in. So I, I can't have every each and every speaker answering each question. So I'm going to redirect this question to specific speakers, if, if that makes sense. Uh, we've got a question on uh, by Hamad al suwedi and his question is who decides uh, who decides on the demolition or the preservation of, of buildings? And is there a case of the overuse of heritage in modern buildings? So maybe we'll start, Sultan. So with regards to the UAE, of course, the UAE being a federal structure, uh, every, uh, every emirate has its own entity uh, and sometimes multiple entities that are concerned with preservation of uh, heritage and uh, modern buildings. Uh, for instance, in, in Sharjah, you have the, uh, the Sharjah Art Foundation that preserved the, the flying saucer building that Roberto showed, but there are parallel uh, 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 there are par parallel entities like the Sharjah Museums Authority that has a number of buildings. Then you have the Sharjah Department of Culture that has its own buildings. So you have multiple layers. And in Dubai, you also have multiple layers, whether it's uh, Dubai culture being one of them, but also you have the, 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 uh, the ruler's court that also is concerned with some buildings like the John Harris designed the uh, 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 office of the ruler on the creek that's a separate entity however i'd like to uh, add that uh, recently i've been a member of a committee known as the technical committee for modern heritage of the uae and we are considering which buildings to we've been meeting over the past uh, uh, two years considering uh, the structure of the regulations of which buildings to preserve across the UAE as a federation, and of course these will uh, these will be um, recommendations to the Emirates because of the UAE structure. You cannot enforce a law on the other Emirates, but these are sort of recommendations on what to follow uh, and encourage the Emirates, the various Emirates, to preserve. Uh, their buildings. The issue we are running into, of course, is compensation. Is how to um, how to you know uh, how to uh, uh, assess which building should remain. Sometimes you have major infrastructure projects that are in the middle of a uh, that that come that clash with the uh, locations of these buildings. So these are all issues that we are contending with now. But it's in the progress. It's happening, and I'm quite excited. Thank you. Great to hear. And, and the next question I think is appropriate for Roberto. Uh, this is by Jackie Armijo. And the question is about, you know, can you talk a bit about documentation of neighborhoods of the different communities of uh, primarily immigrant communities? And, and, and Jackie says, I remember my parents living in Little Palestine, Kuwait City in the 70s, Satwa in the early 20, 2000s and small Palestinian and Yemeni neighborhoods in Abu Dhabi, et cetera. So Roberto, do you want to, to take that one? Uh, thank you, Clemens, and thank you for the question. It would probably, we need to do a panel specific on, on these. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll try to, uh, to, to, to quickly say my, 
my view of of this topic and actually i touch base upon this topic in, in, in my chapter in the book we are presenting today. Now, this fact that the, um, the, the, the modernist project happened in central part of the cities. And then because of a series of master plans, and I'm referring to Kuwait in this specific case, but it's not different from other cities. Um, what happened is that the, the entire population was, uh, was uh, invited to uh, new neighborhood units that were you know designed uh, as a consequence of the first master plan in 1951 and onward so the center remained basically empty it took 20 years to be uh, demolished entirely from the mud houses and the courtyard houses etc uh, and only a small part of the center was rebuilt into a, some sort of a commercial slash beach business slash administrative center, sort of, sort of a downtown in, in, the, in the American way, if you want. Um, so the majority of the population was not living in the center any longer. And along the year, I mean, this space became, um, became available for, for what you might call other nationalities or other citizenships, you know, for people who are not um, locals, but they find in the low prices of this abandoned building the possibility to, you know, to dwell. Um, so we, I, I had a statistics that would say that there were still a, more than a thousand people living in the city center of, of, of Kuwait City, and most of them are living in this type of building or in the Sawaber when it was still up. Um, so um, that is the demographic. And um, but it's it's um, you have to really go through the the numbers to understand who's living where and and why. You know? uh, so there's no plan to preserve communities, and because there's officially there's no I mean, it's not di divided. It's not segregated by 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 race. It's simply divided by I mean how big is your wallet? Uh, how much you can afford to pay for your rent, and that will buy you. A, a, I don't know, two or three rooms or an apartment in certain neighborhoods. So it's, uh, this is not easy to trace or to understand. Uh, and, uh, and that's why there's no policy to say we're going to preserve, at least I'm, I'm talking about Kuwait City, not, I cannot speak for other, other cities in the Gulf, but it's, it's not easy to understand or to how to preserve certain type of dwelling, certain type of communities. Thanks, Roberto. Uh, the next question is uh, for Marco. Uh, it's from Asif Shudra, my colleague. And, and the question is about, you know, uh, palm tree designs as, as visible traces of Arab heritage. And he's asking whether there are intellectual discussions among architects regarding this idea of palm tree designs and whether there's any merit to keep it or to do away with it. Yeah, uh, Marco. I, I think it's a very good question, actually, um, especially because um, we talked about sustainability and it could potentially be a sustainable, pro, uh, sustainable um, uh, uh, material, uh, especially on the on the um, on the uh, we're following up on on the on the very victorious. Uh, um, um, Sorry, uh, the, the 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 UAE was awarded the, the Golden Lion, the UAE Pavilion, on 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 the idea of following the, this kind of sustainable materials using salt and concrete. But for for palm tree design, it was always kind of like an, there was a very high level of ephemerality tied up to it because it it, it doesn't have a longevity of let's say other types of of wood materials like like oak and tropical woods or hardwoods. Um, but but there has been a lot of um, interest in it. There has been a lot of study on 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 the actual uh, historical aspect of, of of palm tree, which is in by the way in the UAE is is commonly known as Arish, and um, and 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 it actually varied as well from different Emirates, whatever it's in the Northern Emirates in in Dar al and Fujairah, to to Dubai, Shasha, um, Umar and and and. And even within Abu Dhabi as well, and Alain as well, there was and Liwa, which is the Western region. Um, 
so there is potential there for for uh, for investigation it's just that it's uh, to find an actual example of, of, a, of an old it, it's not and even finding um, traditional builders of Irish is is a little bit tricky but it's still this this skill has still has been it's still possible to actually be uh, be found Lena, do you have anything do you want to add to that or I think there's also, I'm, I'm not sure if they're published or not, but I know there are some people who are interested in reinventing how Arish was done. So not necessarily using the traditional method, but using Arish as a, or, or the palm front as a substance in some other materials. So there's also the opportunity to combine old material with a new building material to produce like a different material that didn't exist. So I think it's something that, the, there are studies that are ongoing at the moment in time, and maybe we'll be able to see some experiments at some point in the future. And, and the other form as well, just to just to finish up, is the black tent as well, as a form of enclosure and trying to figure out, not copying, but actually trying to understand, there's a whole element of how the black tent actually works, and the Bedouin tent, and, and, and which is absolutely amazing it's so organic as well the way you actually interact with the cold with rain with water how it closes up when it gets wet um and this is something that we could uh where the process will lead and, and our current kind of lab we're kind of looking into how to incorporate this not something that looks like a black tent, but actually trying to figure out how we can capture that essence of of uh of architectural kind of um uh, reconstruction in trying to uh, applicate itself to different climate conditions. So it behaves like a black tent. <laughs> Thank you, Lina and Marco. Uh, the next question is for uh, both Lina and Suha, and this is on health facilities or the, uh, the design of, of health facilities in general across the Gulf and Middle East, catering, especially clinics, catering to women and children's health by design. Are they still you know, located in the obscure part of the whole uh, wider urban layout are there. Some have separate entry and exits for female patients. So can design lead to change in societal norms? And, and this is the question. So for, for Lena and Suha, maybe we start with, with Lena. Uh, I think, okay, from what I, in Abu Dhabi, there are, or in UAE, there are some clinics and hospitals that are dedicated for women and children. And within the bigger hospitals and the health facilities, there are uh, facilities or wards that are dedicated for women and children. Uh, but I think we need to differentiate between uh, the, medical the medical aspect of it, which is dedicated because of medical needs versus the social aspect of it where, uh, some design decisions are taken in respect or in consideration of, let's say, a specific group or a, so a social group of uh, that addresses women and children, and uh, and um, and I think uh, we, we have seen, like in the modern buildings of how they're done, there there is a little there is a bit of both because there is always. Uh, there's always this force of integration because we live in a very multicultural society. So there's always this force of integration, but there's all, you always find this essences of respecting the culture and respecting uh, the segregation as well. Uh, we've got two more questions to wrap up our discussion. And the first one, I think I, I will give it to uh, Roberto. Uh, it is from uh, Georgi, who's still, who is a visiting professor here at, at the Middle East Institute. His question is, the first skyscrapers were built from sun-baked brick in Yemen, Shibam. So is there any intention to recreate one? <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> to, my, to my knowledge, no. I don't know how many stories you can go up with, uh, with that technology. Probably not much. And it depends also from the, the weather, where exactly you want to do it, maybe. Yemen is dry enough, but other places like here is more humid. I don't know how much you can you can work on this technology. But I mean, bottom line is that I have no idea. Mm, there's, to my knowledge, I, I don't know. There's been work on 
as Marco was mentioning before, you know, finding a new way to create bricks, uh, more traditional ways, and then you know, with these type of bricks, uh, you know, imagining other type of dwellings, but for 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 uh, high risers, I, I haven't heard anything. I maybe Marco Lina can help me with in here, and if you guys have knowledge of other experiments in this sense not particular to high rise but i know there are experiments of uh, convert it, converting sand into a brick and that brick is a buildable material but i'm not aware of uh, of any experiment that takes that beyond into a, a building <laughs> also and also this this uh, um this this there has been experiments about using a bacteria to bond the sand as well to actually create a solid uh, build, uh, a possible building material. Uh, but that, as far as I know, it's just being theoretical. We haven't seen, haven't seen the, we haven't seen anything. Um, and I know there was some people investigating that. Mm. Thank you, thank you, Roberto, Marco, and Dina. So our final question to wrap up our discussion, I will give. All the speakers a chance to to express themselves on this and i think it's quite appropriate or apt because this question is to do with uh, the pandemic and in the pandemic you talked a bit about public spaces before uh, the question is about you know parks and streets and and the, you know in public space we've seen the, the the increased use of people walking and strolling and exercising on the in the parks and streets during these times especially when there were restrictions imposed. So how is the Gulf authorities, how are Gulf authorities going to, to deal with this in, you know, in, in the future, seeing this kind of trend happening? Uh, and then let's just start with uh, Sultan and going all the way down in, in our original sequence. Uh, thank you. Um, I'm not sure I can speak on behalf of what the future plans are, but uh, of course, um, you know, when you think of these heritage buildings, there are challenges like ventilation, for example, cooling down these buildings, uh, maybe uh, introducing electrical wiring. So they're, they're quite complicated. And especially in a pandemic, you need to have a circulation uh, of, um, you know, of, uh, of the climate control. So I wonder, I'm actually interested in seeing how this will be uh, used. However, just from the last uh, year or so, we have uh, just in the last few, few months even, we have seen many uh, many buildings or many heritage sites open up once again uh, in Abu Dhabi, in Dubai, and today even in Sharjah, the Art Foundation space is a major event. So people have to be responsible, uh, and I think treat these treat these buildings with the respect that they would treat with each other. With I think that I'll end with that. Thank you, Roberto. Um, yeah, um, it's a million dollar question. I think it. It's an opportunity, and I'm not the first saying that, uh, but it's an opportunity to rethink the public space um, pandemic um, in the Middle East, in the Gulf, but in general, all around the world. Um, it's, it's a possibility to rethink about what is private, what is public, what is in between, and how we can, you know, not only profit of public spaces, but also contribute to make the public space accessible and um, so I'm, I'm, I also don't know what are the visions in the future for here or for other countries but I'm, I'm curious to see how people will respond to the you know the, the, the freedom of accessing to public spaces now that we've been deprived of that for a couple of years. Thanks Roberto. So Marco? Um, I think again same as Sultan I can't really I speak to what the, the the common approach by the by the authority by the uh, local councils and authorities are, but my from my experience or anecdotal experience from from the from the and it may be very similar to to a lot of uh, our, our viewers here and listeners and the audience is that um, during the lockdown itself, I, I, I actually my apartment was was is right next door to a park. It's actually called Khalifa Park, and it's a huge park. And during the lockdown itself, the park itself was shut. So, so the, 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 and then people needed 
to go somewhere and and we all experienced i don't know if if, if something was similar was happening in singapore but it was what we, we used to call the zombies and there'd be families walking around the car park because that was the only place where we could actually do and we were actually walking around in circles in the car park for the park but the actual park itself was shut now i, I i'm hoping that some of these instances will help uh, authorities like um, local authorities to understand uh, more about the importance of public space and how how um, obviously climate plays an important role. And it's just what Suha say. This is literally a whole discussion itself because the element of privacy, gender segregation, cultural differences, and and climate is a big, big, big important aspect. Um, but um, but I'm hoping that some of these um, instances have shown that that people yearn for these spaces, and and you can see it. Abu Dhabi, and, and I, I can only speak as well for Abu Dhabi. So I I, I'm gonna, I, I live there. The authorities and the developers are actually making sure that these there is places for people to walk through. Because it's not when I first got here, uh, 11, 12 years ago, um, it what I did notice it wasn't part of the culture very much even though a lot of the cultures that came here were it was embedded in their culture it wasn't really but slowly in the, in the 11 years i've been here has changed a lot a lot thank you and finally nina uh well again i can't speak for the authorities and their plans but uh an observation that i've made living in abu dhabi for like really long time is that the buildings transition the, the buildings used to have to be very much the interior space of the buildings used to be very much connected with the outdoor building and that in all aspects whether it's in residential or in the commercial through different openings and through the recent years there was a shift towards a more climatically controlled interiors were actually fully climatically controlled interiors so a lot of typologies of these new developments that came up recently in the past decade i would say they are fully climatically controlled and when they're not they have a very limited uh, opening or a very limited uh, interaction with the outdoor now i believe with the pandemic uh, it's going to ask us to it's going to force us to go back and question that climate controlled vision and integrate a little bit more to the environment and uh, uh, and uh, because as the simplest thing for was the pandemic is ventilation right so how do you how do you ensure that vent ventilation or there's a flow of air uh, in a harsh climate like UAE <laughs> thank you Lena so this has been a wonderful discussion we've come to the end of it and, and you know talking about that public spaces and the use of it you know, I remember in the pre-pandemic times, you know, people were, were walking in shopping malls, exercising during Ramadan before breaking fast. So this is again that, that whole show of demand that, you know, that there is that kind of thirst for, for this kind of spaces. So coming back to our panel, thank you very much to our five speakers, also contributors to urban modernity in the contemporary Gulf. You can get your copy on the Routledge website or in open access PDF. Thank you to our audience for putting forward your thought-provoking questions and also of course I have to thank my colleagues with the events team Sharon especially for setting this all up and making it operational so thank you very much everyone and hope to see you soon